In the previous episode... Fatigue can be caused by imbalances in many different areas. So number one, oxygen. If we don't get enough oxygen into the tissues, into the cells, and into the mitochondria, we can't make energy. So breathing is important. Teaching people how to breathe, you know, diaphragmatic breathing, super important for their energy levels. Welcome to Reinvent Healthcare, a podcast for health and wellness practitioners passionately committed to transforming our current broken disease-focused system. Your host, Dr. Rita Marie Los Calzo, is devoted to helping you get results with complex health challenges like autoimmune, hormonal imbalances, and chronic health challenges caused by nutritional and lifestyle-induced imbalances. Here's your host, Dr. Rita Marie. Welcome back to Reinvent Healthcare, the podcast for health and wellness practitioners who are passionate about making a difference. Continuing on the theme of energy metabolism, today's episode is focused on the lab tests that can be run to identify the underlying causes of fatigue. Since most of the clients who seek help from practitioners, both functional and conventional, suffer from fatigue, exhaustion, or other signs of sluggish metabolism, it's really important for you as a practitioner to know how to identify the underlying causes. Some of the main causes of low energy, we covered several of these in the last episode, are anemia, all different kinds of anemia, neurotransmitter imbalances, hormone imbalances like thyroid, adrenals, and insulin, mitochondrial dysfunction, nutrient insufficiencies, and quite a number of nutrients can get involved here, impaired digestive function, including microbiome imbalance, immune system dysfunction, detox pathways, cardiovascular impairment, inflammation, cancer, and a whole lot more. So, As practitioners, it's really important that we understand why a person's tired, not just slap on adaptogens and energizing nutrients and foods and all that. We need to understand why in order to give these people a boost, in order to understand and correct the underlying problems so that we don't just give them energy, we help them to restore balance. So in order to know what's at the root of fatigue and what tests we can run, We need to understand what's available. We need to understand the physiology, the functionality, the biochemistry. And I think it's important to start all this with a comprehensive blood chemistry panel and to know how to read it from a functional perspective, not to just scan it to see if the lab marked anything low or high. That's missing a lot of functional imbalances that you can identify and help your clients to fix. So the blood holds many clues as to the imbalances related to fatigue, and you have to know how to find them. Things like anemia and hypothyroidism, blood sugar and insulin dysregulation, nutrient deficiencies, yeah, nutrient deficiencies, mostly without actually testing the nutrients, which is cool. We'll get into that. Cardiovascular dysfunction, easy to test on a blood chem, but we need to know the extra goodies that we need to do in order to really look at the cardiovascular function. And then, of course, there's inflammation and immune system markers, easy to test on a blood chemistry, and there are subtle things that you want to know in order to be able to read them from a functional perspective. You can even find signs of adrenal dysfunction on a blood chemistry before you go in and test additional things like salivary cortisol levels and and the Dutch test. So there's so much of this that can be detected in the blood, and learning how to do this is really, really important. We teach a very, very in-depth module on this in our nutritional endocrinology practitioner training because I think it is so important. There's probably 15, 20 hours worth of discussion on this in the program. That's how important I think it is because I see all the time that practitioners, conventional practitioners and functional practitioners alike, miss a lot of things that they can identify and help their clients to balance. Anemia is one of the easiest things to test for and to identify on a blood test, but quite frankly, I think most conventional doctors don't do it right. They'll oftentimes just test iron, right? And that that's it. Or they'll test ferritin 
And that's it. They don't test all the other markers for it. Of course, they look at they look at hemoglobin and hematocrit and those sorts of things. But it's really important to do a thorough analysis to see what kind of anemia a person has and if they indeed have anemia. And the markers that I like to look at are red blood cells. How many blood, red blood cells do they have? Are they high or are they low? Hemoglobin, is it high or is it low? Hematocrit, is it high or or is it low? When we look at hemoglobin, we want to look at that in relationship to iron. So if we have low iron and normal or high hemoglobin, that could indicate that we have a B6 deficiency because B6 is important in incorporating the iron into the hemoglobin, into the red blood cells. So it's really important to be looking at not just individual markers, but ratios. When we look at the MCV, mean corpuscular volume, if we just look at it and say, oh, it's low, then it's an iron deficiency anemia that may not be the full picture. If we look at it and we see that it's high and we say, oh, it's a macrocytic anemia and it may be B12 or folate, that is true. And there's another option. It could be perfectly normal and we can have a, an iron deficiency anemia and a macrocytic B12 or folate deficiency. So we have to look at other markers to confirm. You know, if we want to know if it's, if it's the um, B12 folate, we can look at numbers like homocysteine. If the homocysteine is high and the MCV is normal, it could be that we have an underlying iron deficiency anemia along with a B12 deficiency. And a lot of doctors these days aren't even running iron. I'll look at somebody's test and I want to identify these things and I don't even see the iron. I believe it's super important if you're going to be testing for anemia that you're testing the iron and the ferritin. Because if the iron is low and the ferritin is low, good chance you got an iron deficiency anemia. But what if the iron is high and the ferritin is low? Well, that says that the storage is low but the iron is high, which means that the body's unable to convert from the active serum form into the storage form that goes into ferritin. So that could be, after a lot of, lot of looking and searching, I found that there's a melatonin-dependent pathway. And if melatonin is low, indeed, you can have the iron be high and the ferritin low. And I actually discovered this once on a call with somebody. We were looking at this and going, why is this happening? And she was a practitioner, and we started digging into pathways, and we found this. And sure enough, it turned out that she had recently gotten her melatonin tested as part of a hormone panel, and it was low. And as she started to supplement and bring up her melatonin, guess what? Her iron came down. So we have to look at these things. The body is not just an absolute number means something. We have to look at the ratios. The other extreme, if the iron is low, but the ferritin is high, why would that be? Why would the body not be converting the, the uh, storage form into the active form? We have to look at that. And oftentimes that's related to inflammation or liver, liver problems. So we have to look at all these things. The typical panel that's done for anemia would be iron or ferritin, depending on the lab, depending on the doctor's orientation, and then transferrin and iron, total iron binding capacity. Well, I don't think that's enough. I really don't think that's enough. So looking at this, really study this piece. And when you're doing an anemia check, do a complete anemia check. The other thing that's a clue is red blood cell distribution, RDW. If you've got a normal MCV, but you have a high RDW, what that's saying is there's a lot of variation in the size of the cells. So there might be a combination of an iron and a B12 folate deficiency. So let's move on. We could spend an hour of that on just that alone, but it's, I'm giving you enough to get you started and get you thinking differently about the standard blood chemistry. So thyroid, we thyroid is another thing we think of, right? We go anemia or is it hypothyroid? And so the typical, typically conventionally trained doctor is going to run a TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. And if it's between, I don't know, 0, 0.00 and 4.5, they'll tell you it's normal. In fact, that's not the optimal range. We want it to be between 1 and 3, ideally between 1 and 2.5. What that is, is how hard does the pituitary have to work to get the thyroid to take action? 
And if it has to work really hard and brings that number up, then we probably have a sluggish thyroid. But if, if it's the number happens to be four or 4.5, they're going to tell you it's fine. And a lot of times you're going to have patients come in that have all the symptoms of hypothyroidism and the TSH is within the quote normal range and they haven't gone further. They haven't looked further and they tell the person that, nope, you don't have hypothyroidism. You have depression. Here's some antidepressants. You have constipation, here's some laxatives, et cetera. You get the picture, right? So we want to we want to keep these numbers in the ideal range. So I encourage you to learn what the ideal ranges are. If you download the document that we have for you, the, it's at uh, reinventhealthcare.com forward slash energy. I have a list of some of these tests that I'm talking about with the ideal ranges. It's important that you look to keep people in the ideal range. You don't want to keep them in the average range because the average person is pretty darn sick. Okay, so TSH is one. But another thing that I believe strongly in doing is total T4. And yeah, there's some indication that total T4 gets has things that interfere with it. But here's why. If we do the total T4, we know how much thyroid hormone the thyroid's producing, assuming the person's not on medication. When we just do the free T4, we don't know if the body didn't produce enough T4 or it's produced plenty, but it's holding on to it because we have an excessive amount of thyroid binding globulin. And that can be caused by excess estrogen. So then we start to ask people, are you on birth control pills? And are they exposed to xenoestrogens, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of information that we get when we do all of these tests. So my recommendation is to do the TSH and the total T4 and the free T3 and the free T4. Optionally, the total T3, but I don't find that as telling. And then the antibodies, thyroid peroxidase antibodies and antithyroglobulin. Really important to do the antibodies because you can tell when there is a thyroid problem before it actually manifests in alterations in these numbers. I highly recommend that you run the antibodies on everybody. And if it's a female and they tend to have problems with weight and other hormone problems, rerun them every year. It's really an important thing. The other one, if you suspect somebody has hyperthyroidism, usually not going to be presenting as fatigue, but they may because with hyperthyroidism, they're go, go, go. They're expending all this energy because the metabolism is so high and by the end of the day, they're exhausted. So you may may or may not run thyroid-stimulating immunoglobin. I don't usually run the thyroid binding globulin. I usually guess at it by the other numbers, but that's something you could run to get a a complete picture if some of the other numbers aren't giving you the right number or the right information. Um, Reverse T3, I sometimes run. Again, I can usually detect whether I suspect reverse T3 is a problem by the ratio between T3 and T4. But there's additional things that give you an idea of how the thyroid's running. You've got to run the vitamin D. And if the vitamin D is low, you can't get the thyroid to produce properly. You also should be looking at a lipid panel because low thyroid function will lead to high cholesterol in spite of good diet and other kinds of of factors that you would not expect this person to have high cholesterol. I recommend a vitamin A and homocysteine analysis because the receptors on the cells, the thyroid receptors are not going to work properly if we have excess homocysteine or not enough vitamin A. And if I've run genetics on somebody and I notice that they have a SNP called BCM01, then I'm even more likely to be looking at their vitamin A status or just supplementing with vitamin A to help them and support them. HSCRP, highly sensitive C-reactive protein, because inflammatory markers will affect the thyroid receptors and also will affect the conversion from T4 to T3. The other thing I run in relationship to thyroid is fasting insulin. And the reason is that insulin elevations can interfere with thyroid function, especially at the receptor level. So these that's what I think is a complete thyroid panel. Again, reinventhealthcare.com forward slash energy, and I'll give you a list of those. What else? What else can contribute from a hormonal imbalance that can be detected in the blood is blood sugar. 
So yeah, fasting glucose, yeah, it's not a great marker. It shows it's one of the last ones to change when there's a blood glucose imbalance, when there's an insulin dysregulation, as we spoke about in our metabolic processes section of this podcast. But I like to look at insulin. I like to look at insulin because insulin is usually elevated early on in the process of blood sugar and insulin dysregulation. So I like to look at glucose, insulin, hemoglobin A1C. Sometimes that's accurate, sometimes it's not, depending on whether the person is anemic or whether the person is an athlete. See peptide, if those other numbers don't give me the right amount that gives me an idea of how much pancreatic function is left, I usually do that when I, I suspect that somebody might be in the later stages of blood sugar dysregulation. And then, of course, antibodies, which, again, I do that when I suspect that something's not right with the other numbers. What else can we do? Well, if you don't have good cardiovascular function, how are you going to have energy, right? The heart has to pump the blood to all aspects of the body. So I like to look at lipid panels, but not just the standard lipid panels. I like to run an advanced lipid panel that includes particle sizes and lipoprotein little a. And that gives us a sense of how this is running, how well the cardiovascular system may be running. And if I'm not really clear from my numbers, and I really suspect something might be going on with this person's heart, especially based on family history or the way they're presenting, I'll run a calcium score. It's a CT of the heart that gives us some great information, very low radiation exposure and well worth it. What else can we look at in the standard blood? We're still in the standard blood mostly, but you know, maybe some a little extra add-ons that are not done in the conventional one. What about inflammation and immune system dysregulation? If someone has a lot of inflammation in their body that shows up, maybe it's joint inflammation, maybe it's gut inflammation, maybe it's in the skin. The inflammation is a stress on the body and causes the energy to go low. Or maybe there's an autoimmune process going on, and we see low energy in almost all the autoimmune conditions that we've identified. So it's really important to look at a CBC with differential, and you want to look at the ratios between the various types of white blood cells. Of course, CBC red blood cells is going to give us a state of the anemia and uh, the hemoglobin and the hematocrit and all the things we just talked about. But looking at the white blood cells is super important. And we look at neutrophils and lymphocytes. And it's possible to determine from those numbers if there might be some low-grade hidden bacterial or viral infection. So it's really important to learn how to do these. C-reactive protein and ESR, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, those are both inflammatory markers. So those are good things to be looking at. And then homocysteine, which we mentioned earlier with relationship to the um, thyroid receptors, but homocysteine is an important inflammatory marker. and gives us an idea of the cardiovascular system integrity. So you see that there's a lot of stuff here right on the standard CBC and the chem panel, plus a few extras that you can tell what might be going on that's causing this person to be tired. And sometimes you find things that are kind of scary, right? Like you might look at super high or low white blood cell counts and then find that there's further testing done that indicates that this person has a lymphoma or a leukemia or other kinds of cancer. So it's really important not to overlook these things. Um, nutrient deficiencies are super, super important to look at. Vitamin D, you can measure straight in the blood. It gives you an accurate indication. Usually I run the D3 as the inactive form, the D3, 25-hydroxy D3. But sometimes you might need to run the 125, especially if you're looking to get a more functional look at what may be happening because the, it gets activated in the kidney and the livers, and that can give us an idea if there's some issues there. So we want to look at the B6 I mentioned earlier. You can usually tell if there's a B6 deficiency from some of these markers. They're indirect, so you have to dig deeper. But you can get an indication that maybe B6 is off when the high iron hemoglobin ratio is off off, it's high, and also if the homocysteine is elevated. With the folate, super important for keeping your energy up and keeping the red blood cells working. We look at MCV, I mean corpuscular volume, and we also look at homocysteine. Folate's pretty good measured in the serum, so you could do a serum folate. But B12, eh, I don't trust the B12 in the serum. Well, if I get the B12 run in the serum and it is low, then I can assume that this person has low B12 function. But if it's normal or high, 
I want to dig deeper because I oftentimes see people with methylation issues where their serum B12 is high, but then their MCV or the gold standard for B12, which is methylmalonic acid, might be high, which indicates a deficiency. So these are things you want to go deeper with. Vitamin B2, we don't think about B2 in the serum because you can't really measure it well in the serum. But when you have the anion gap, which is a ratio of some of the electrolytes uh, or the glucose or both high that could indicate a B2 deficiency. You can have carbon dioxide, you can have hemoglobin, hematocrit, and LDH low, and that could indicate a B2 deficiency. Doesn't mean that these are absolute markers, but they're functional indications, and we want to go deeper and look there. Zinc, people miss this. They try to measure the serum zinc, and zinc in the serum doesn't get measured very well. But if we look and we have low alkaline phosphatase, especially if it's in combination with low white blood cells, then that can indicate a zinc deficiency. And as you help them and supplement with the zinc-rich foods, or you supplement them with zinc itself, or you get their, their stomach acid balanced, you can get some good indications here. And then molybdenum. Molybdenum is important in the detoxification pathways. And if we have high iron and low uric acid, that could mean a molybdenum deficiency. And oftentimes people have trouble with detoxification. When we supplement with molybdenum, they get really good results. And the last nutrient I'll talk about, there's others, um, and there's other ways to detect these, is copper. When we have low uric acid and low hemoglobin, then oftentimes that could be a copper deficiency and it has to be further investigated. If you want to do good nutrient evaluation, you want to run other tests, the functional tests. So a functional test that works for testing for nutrient imbalances, there's three that I've used. One is the NutraVal from Genova. Another is metabolomics from Genova. And another one is the, uh, oh, four actually, SpectraCell, which measures white blood cell levels of these nutrients. And then there's one from Vibrant America. It's just called the micronutrients panel. We go into major detail on all of these and when you use them and how they work in our nutritional endocrinology practitioner training. The last one I want to mention in terms of the blood, and this one we don't usually think of, but there are some markers in the blood that could indicate that the adrenals are out of balance. And this is this is indicated in lots of different studies. I've learned it from various functional medicine practitioners like Dr. Karazian and Dr. Walsh, and they talk a lot about how you can you can in, get indication of how the adrenals are functioning. How's the cortisol level when you look at the sodium and potassium levels? Let's take a look at some of the functional tests that you can look at to find out if indeed there's an underlying root cause of the person's fatigue and help them to get their energy back. I love the Dutch test, which is a dried urine test, and it tests for cortisol levels at various times. It tests for cortisol metabolites. It also tests for the steroid hormones, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, DHEA, and all the metabolites. Plus, it gives you some organic acids, some of the indirect indicators of vitamin and mineral deficiencies. Uh, for example, there's B12, there's a couple for B6, there's a glutathione marker, and then there's a couple of neurotransmitter markers. Markers. There's the NutraVal and others that I just mentioned, and they look at the, the nutrients in a way that is functional and specific. So they don't just look in the blood, they look in the red blood cells, they look in the white blood cells, they look at markers that should be you know, high or low or are out of balance, so say Krebs cycle. Metabolites, And they'll look at that and say, oh, we might have a B3 deficiency here based on this Krebs cycle marker. And then there's the organic acid test, which there's several companies that do them. And that gives us a lot of those pathways. And we get to see where in those pathways some of these metabolic byproducts build up and which nutrients might be out of balance there. And neurotransmitters as well. And then one of my favorite tests of all time is the fatty acid test. There's the simple blood spot fatty acid test that you can do. It's Genova Labs has it. You press uh, a little bit of blood. They put it on a card. They send it in. And we get an idea of the ratios between omega-3s and 6s, which gives us an idea of how the inflammatory pathways are working in the body. There's also a more advanced fatty acid test that's done as part of the NutraVal and the metabolomics test that is, um, it tests all of the fatty acids. 
You can look at the the B3s and 6s and 9, the saturated fats, and so much more. And that's a more advanced test and gives us a lot of good indication of how this person's functioning. When they don't have good fatty acid balance, it's hard to have good energy. So we've touched the surface of how to test for all of these indications and all of the things that can be causing your client to have low energy. In future episodes, we'll pinpoint some of these tests and go into more detail. If you have questions or suggestions of things that you'd like to learn more about, go to reinventhealthcare.com and up at the top, you'll see a questions box, ask a question. And we have a little place that you can do that. And we check those periodically and then we'll incorporate those into future episodes. So I thank you for being here. I thank you for what you do in the world and your dedication to helping make the world a healthier and happier place. I think it's super excited that we have the tools to help people identify the causes of their fatigue, their low energy, their exhaustion, whatever they're calling it. So rather than just covering it up with caffeine and sugar or quick energy fixes, we can empower them to make the appropriate diet, nutrient, and lifestyle changes that will improve and possibly even save their lives. The more you master the art of using functional principles to identify imbalances and using whole toxin-free foods, herbs, and nutrients to balance body functions, the greater your success in helping these people and empowering them to achieve their health and wellness goals. And I don't know about you, but that's what I'm here for. That's what I'm here for. I love helping people to identify things, to help them solve problems that they've had for years and nobody else has been able to solve for. This was going to lead to a fulfilling and thriving practice. And you're going to feel great at the end of the day because you feel fulfilled because you help people rather than just giving them something to mask their symptoms. You're changing lives for the better. So download the free guide I created to access checklists and support you in helping your clients to restore their energy. In that document, you're going to find a list of the labs, the labs that we've talked about today, so that you have a kind of cheat cheat checklist. And I encourage you to learn more. I encourage you to reach out to to us and see if joining us in some of our practitioner trainings. We do a lot of webinars and we have some amazing programs to help you to become that kind of practitioner that doesn't miss these things. So download the guide at reinventhealthcare.com forward slash energy. And until next time, shine on. Thank you for listening to the Reinvent Healthcare podcast. Join the movement of practitioners that are guiding people to actually get well rather than covering up their symptoms. Connect with us at reinventhealthcare.com to access resources and tools that will empower you to create a thriving health practice.